Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from just east of Jerusalem today, the 16th day of the month of Shabbat 5782. It is January 18th, 2022. This coming Shabbat, we read Parshat Yitro in the book of Exodus, beginning chapter 18, verse 1, concluding chapter 20, verse 23. Of course, the parasha of Ma'amad Har Sinai, the revelation at Mount Sinai. But before we talk about this upcoming parsha, I just want to announce that I'm extremely tired as I make this broadcast, having uh, gotten up this morning at 5 a.m. and spent the day in Shiloh, the site at the actual site of the ancient tabernacle that stood in Shiloh for some 369 years uh, from the days of Yoshua Joshua onward. Uh, we, I went with a, a, a film crew and we filmed and interviewed a number of artisans who are involved in some of the crafts that are necessary for the reproduction of the, of the vessels, temple vessels, and for the reproduction of the parochit, the massive curtain that stood in the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and later in the Holy Temple, which divided the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. And uh, I hope to be able to produce from this a number of short videos, which we will be sharing with you uh, in the upcoming weeks, as we, in a few weeks, will be reading Parshat Truma, which introduces the entire concept of the tabernacle, the holy temple, what it's all about. And of course, from that point on, the book of Exodus is pretty much preoccupied with uh, God's desire for a dwelling place, a mishkan, where his presence can dwell amongst his people. But uh, having been out all day and having got up so early, I am uh, very tired, so I apologize if uh, I drift off. If you hear uh, a few too many moments of silence, it may mean that I fell asleep and uh, you are welcome then to uh, turn off a temple talk. But uh, I will definitely try to speak and have something to say until the very end. You know, we're going through a real cold snap here in Israel. Earlier in this week, actually beginning late last week, we had a tremendous amount of rain all throughout the country. Thank God we always need rain. And uh, there was much flooding. There's always, when we have strong rain in Israel, there's flooding uh, in, the, in the Negev. Uh, the water, it, it builds up quickly and rolls along the surface till it comes to deep uh, ravines, wadis, or nechalim, and they fill it with way of rushing, rushing waterfalls. And uh, if anybody's caught in the road at the wrong time, uh, they can be swept away, God forbid. Uh, and so this is just a, a phenomenon that we have each year in Israel when it rains. In fact, one of the Psalms, a Psalm that we actually say, many people say when they are saying grace after the meal, the, the Psalm of returning to the land of Israel. I'm going to see if I can find it here. It actually makes reference uh, to these rushing waters. In Psalms 126, we read a song of ascents. When Hashem will return to the captivity of Zion, we will be like dreamers, and our mouth will be filled with laughter and our tongue with glad song. Then they will declare among the nations, Hashem has done greatly with these. Hashem has done greatly with us, and we were gladdened. O Hashem, return our captivity like springs in the desert. Those who tear tearfully sow will reap in glad song. He who bears the measure of seeds walks, walks along weeping, but will return in exultation, a, beer, a bearer of his sheaves. And those uh, springs in the desert, as it's translated here in Hebrew, it is ka'afikim uh, banegev. It uh, seems to be referring to this phenomenon when it rains and you have these wonderful rivers that appear out of nowhere. God blesses the land with rain and all of a sudden we have abundant rushing waters and it likens it to the feeling of exaltation when we return from our captivity. And of course, this psalm is ref referring to the returning after the destruction of the first temple, returning to the captivity, or returning from the captivity back to the land of Israel. And it's a song that uh, many people sing uh, before saying grace on Shabbat as an expression of, of exaltation and of thanksgiving. But anyway, I point it out here because of it refers to this phenomenon of this uh, massive rainfall that just accumulates and rushes at, 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 at very fast speed 
uh, with gravity, it, it just rushes and accumulates, and all of a sudden you have these rushing rivers, which can be very, very dangerous, uh, uh, as I said before, if you're caught in them, God forbid. Anyway, we had a lot of rain. The past two days have been clear, but it has gotten very cold. This morning when I went out to Shiloh, which is in the Shomron, Samaria, um, it was, there, was, there was frost in all the fields and uh, ice forming on puddles left from the previous rain. And I posted a photo today that someone took on the Temple Mount of frost uh, covering the vegetation on the Temple Mount. Tomorrow it's supposed to be even colder and with precipitation and uh, it may well snow in Jerusalem. Uh, something that happens usually once or twice a year, but uh, it's always uh, sort of uh, unexpected and um, met with tremendous anticipation. Snow in Jerusalem. Anyway, so that is my reason for being a bit tired and that is an update of the weather here in Israel. And now let's talk about Parshat Yitro. Yitro, of course, is Jethro. Jethro, of course, is the father-in-law of Moshe, who we last saw way before in the book of Exodus, before Moshe returned to, to the land of Egypt to uh, initiate the effort to uh, uh, get Israel out of Egypt. And, of course, that effort involved the ten plagues. So all of a sudden, Yitro is back in the picture. And, um, of course, let's pick up from where we left off last week. Israel has crossed the Sea of Reeds. Israel has gotten uh, the manna. Israel has got a meal of uh, pheasants because they were starving. And Hashem has provided them with water more than one occasion. And then the last event recorded in last week's parsha is, of course, the ambush, the unexpected, unprovoked um, ambush by Amalek on Israel, um, the first attack of what would be many even, uh, in history <laughs> to this day uh, on the people of Israel, and completely unwarranted, unprovoked, and just an act of, of vicious hatred and plunder, which Israel was able to counteract uh, by battling. And of course, Moshe would stand on a mountaintop with his arms raised toward heaven, and when Israel would be focused on his hands and inspired by his, by his gesturing toward heaven, they would prevail. And when Moshe's hands would, would uh, tire and, and, and drop to his sides, Amalek would prevail. So the two men standing on either side of Moshe, uh, Aaron, his brother, and his nephew Hor, Ben Hor, uh, would, uh, would prop up his arms and eventually they put two boulders under each of his arms to keep them raised so that Israel would prevail. So that's where we are right now. And now Israel has moved further into the wilderness and they have encamped at the mountain of God. And all of a sudden we read in Parsha Titra, I'm going to read the first few verses in Hebrew, then in English, Vayishma Yitro, again, chapter 18, verse 1, the book of Exodus, Vayishma Yitro, Kohin Midian, Hotin Moshe, Eit Kol Asher Asa Elohim Moshe Uli Yisrael Amo, Jethro, Yitro, the, the Kohen, the, the priest of Midian. He was a religious figure. He was a, he was a, a, a man who, who was a master of, of the arts of idolatry. He studied idolatry, according to Midrash. He knew all the idolatry in the world. He, underst he was a searcher, but he, he knew idolatry. And so he, he studied all the different idolatries of the world. Uh, the father-in-law of Moshe heard everything that God did to Moshe and to Israel, his people, that Hashem had taken Israel out of Egypt. Yitro, the father-in-law of Moshe, took Tzipporah, the wife of Moshe, after she had been sent away, and her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he, Moshe, had said, I was a sojourner in a strange land. Ger is a sojourner, a stranger, uh, and the name of the other was Eliezer, 
for the God of my father came to my aid. Aid is, Ez, is Ezer or Ezra, and Eli is my God. Eliezer, for the God of my father came to my aid, and he saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Yitro, the father-in-law of Moshe, came to Moshe with his sons and his wife to the wilderness where he was encamped by the mountain of God. He said to Moshe, I, your father-in-law Yitro, have come to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So Yitro has been following the news, and the news, even in those days, spread fast. I mean, this was um, out of the ordinary stuff that was going on, the, the, uh, the, the departure from Egypt, the most powerful country at the time, and of course the miracle at at the sea, uh, even the war against Amalek, the hand of God is seen in all this, and Yitro, being a very, very observant man and very concerned and, 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 and obsessed with these things, sees it right away. And he says, uh, um, says uh, now we're continuing verse 7, Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law, and he prostrated himself and kissed him, and each inquired about the other's, well, other's well-being. They came to the tent, and Moshe told his father-in-law everything that Hashem had done to Pharaoh and Egypt for Israel's sake, all the travail that had befallen them on the way, and that Hashem had rescued them. And it says then, Yitro rejoiced over all the good that Hashem had done for Israel, uh, that he had rescued it from the land of Egypt. Yitro said, Baruch Hashem, blessed be Hashem, who has rescued you from the hand of Egypt, from the hand of Pharaoh, who has rescued the people from under the hand of Egypt. Now I know that Hashem is greater than all the gods, for in the very matter in which the Egyptians had conspired against them, Hashem has, has proven victorious. And then it says, Yitro, the father-in-law of Moshe, took a burnt offering and a feast offering for God, and Aaron and all the elders of Israel came to eat bread with the father of, father-in-law of Moshe before God. Okay. So this wonderful, wonderful scene that is being described, um, it's just, it's, it's so human. It's, it's so full of emotion. Again, as I said, Yitro was, was a very smart and astute observer of, of, of the ways of the world. And until now, he had been an idol, idol, idolater. That's what he knew. But he understood from this point when he saw that Hashem what he had done, how he had defeated the most powerful man who thought he was a god, Pharaoh, in the world. And all that he had done for Israel, really he realized that there's, there's a Shem. All the other gods don't combine, don't measure up. And so he's convinced now. He's convinced that there's one god, one god in the world. And it's so beautiful. It says, how do we know this? In verse 9, it says, Yitro rejoiced over all the good that Hashem had done for Israel for he had rescued it from the, hand of, from the land of Egypt. In Hebrew, it says, Vayichad Yitro al kol hatova asher asa Hashem leYisrael. Vayichad Yitro. Vayichad. Which is translated here, and it means he rejoiced. Uh, hedva. Uh, it's, it's, it's a word that means rejoicing, but it's an unusual uh, use of the word, unusual construction of it. Vayichad. Vayichad also means, and he made one, he united so what I'm trying to convey here and what I think the, the verse is saying in a very deep way is that he rejoiced in God's oneness, that this, this revelation that he, that, he, that he received from observing what Hashem had done was, was brought him tremendous joy in understanding that Hashem is one and that there's one God and there's only God and that's what there is. And that gave him tremendous joy. And then, of course, it's a beautiful, beautiful passage. I just love it. Uh, how he, re, you know, he he embraces. He and, and Moshe embrace. They ask each other how they're doing, what's new, and then, of course, the the, the offerings that Yitro makes uh, with with Aaron and all the elders. It's a very, very beautiful, heartwarming passage. Um, and again, it's very interesting that that the Torah brings out this out, out, outside observer um, a, as a way of confirming how amazing all that has happened, all that's transpired, how awe-inspiring it is, and how revealing it is that there is really one God in the world. You know, we read the story from Israel's point of view as the Torah presents it, and Israel, you know, they're in the middle of it. They complain they have their ups and downs. They have their failings. You know, uh, they had their moments of 
peak uh, appreciation as they cross the, the, the Sea of Reeds and sang the wonderful Song of the Sea, um, which was, you know, praise and gratitude at its highest expression. But then soon after, we see them at a low. And again, the low, they're thirsty, they're hungry, they're in an unknown place, they're in a, a hostile environment, they're, they're uncertain, it's, it's all unknown to them. It's all very human. Um, so it's nice to hear this confirmation from a third party, as it were, you know, a, an observer, a neutral observer maybe, uh, who says, wow, this is, you know, amazing what's going on here. And it just proves uh, to me, Hitro, the man who until this point, I was, you know, I was the expert on, on idolatry. And now I'm just going to throw all those books away because there's one God in the world. I find that to be very inspiring and very revealing. Then, the next uh, chapter in this week's Parsha has to do with the fact that Moshe, uh, Yitro, the next morning wakes up and observes Moshe is standing or sitting before the, a line of people. The entire nation is lined up. And Yitro says, what are you doing? He goes, well, the people, you know, they need judgment. They have... Uh, problems, they have disagreements, they have uh, things that they don't know how to solve. I'm the one that with the knowledge. They come to me for judgment. And uh, Tietro says, well, this is not going to work, Moshe. You know, you're going to be, you're, you know, white, you're going to be worn out if you do this day after day. You can't possibly hold, hold, hold up for long if, if this is the case. He says, what you need to do, unsolicited advice here, but what you need to do is Appoint judges. You have to teach them and appoint judges. Judges over, over. How does he put it? Judges over, over. Mm -hmm. Judges over, over thousands and judges over hundreds and leaders of fifty and leaders of tens. Meaning you'll have you'll set up a, a judicial system, with, with, a hierarchy of courts, and. Lesser matter, matters will be addressed by the lower courts. And you, Moshe, will teach, will teach these judges. And you have to have people, he mentions here, people who are upright, people who aren't going to be swayed uh, or, or, God forbid, uh, um, be corrupted by, by uh, gifts or offers or even be swayed by the fact that a person you know, is an upstanding person or a person of high rank and another person is not of high rank. These, these judges have to be completely upright, righteous, honest, straightforward. And you create this system. And then the problems that the lower courts can't solve go to the higher courts. And ultimately, the problems that only Moshe can address, Moshe will address. But this way, he doesn't have to deal with every uh, single incident of, of this or that uh, problem, the misunderstanding, disagreement, or or simple question of what are we supposed to do? So m this man, Yitro, who's not from the children of Israel, uh, he's a Midianite. He's Moshe's father-in-law. And of course, he's been a righteous man all along. You know, he brought Moshe into his house. He, he introduced Moshe to his daughter, Tzipora. He blessed Moshe when Moshe said, I'm going back to Egypt, because Hashem is sending me back. He blessed him and said, you know, you go on your way and you do this. And now he's back again. And now he has this tremendous advice. And basically, he sets up the system, which will be the system uh, of, of, the, of the court system in Israel from this point on, uh, with the highest courts being the Sanhedrin, uh, which we all have heard about. So this... This, you know, a man, Yitro, who we've said in the past, he has, has I think, seven different names. Sometimes he's called Chovev, sometimes he's called Chotel Moshe, sometimes he's called Yitro, sometimes Yeter. There's a few, Ruel, there's a few other names, I believe. And he's sort of a, a mysterious figure, but he's a, a figure that, that has had tremendous influence on Israel, on Moshe and on Israel. And again... Uh, you know, Moshe went to Midian when he fled Egypt uh, as sort of a, you know, a, um, a rough, uh, you know, unschooled young man. And in the company of Yitro, in his, 
taking care of Yitro's flocks is when he had the, the meeting with Hashem at the mountain of Hashem, at the, the burning bush. So Yitro has a huge part in all of this. And I think, um, you know, we need to, to always mention that and, and, and be aware of that and, and consider that, again, Israel is not alone in the world. And Israel's constantly interacting with other nations. Sometimes they're friendly, sometimes they're not. Sometimes these individuals that are not part of the nation of Israel have tremendous gifts to, to, to give Israel. Sometimes they don't. But here's a, a case where, where Yitro is, changes, changes history. Moving past Yitro now, we get to, of course, the, the uh, heart of this week's parsha, which is the revelation at Mount Sinai the giving and receiving of the Ten Commandments, Israel's commitment, verbal commitment, that they will, they will listen and they will do to what Hashem says. Um, the covenant, this is the big covenant, the big marriage ceremony between Israel and Hashem. And again, the fact that this week's parsha bears the name Yitro is testimony to the Torah's tremendous respect for this man. Um... <laughs> you know, they could have called it anything, but they call it Yitro. They don't call it Moshe. They don't call it Mount Sinai. They call it Yitro. So that says a lot. Now, I'm not going to go into a detail, but I think we know the details of what trans transpired at Mount Sinai. And if we want to refresh, of course, this, this is the week. This is the parsha. But, you know, after all God has done for Israel, he's pulled them out of Egypt. He's, you know, made, made quick work of, of Pharaoh. He pulled them through the, the Sea of Reeds. You're hungry, there's food, there's manna, there's, there's bread from heaven every morning. Uh, water, water from a rock. Yes, the people grumble and they're not always appreciative, but God has everything under control. Um, Clearly, God is in charge and he wants to make a covenant, an eternal covenant with Israel. He wants, this is why he brought Israel out of Egypt. He has said this already to Israel. I'm bringing you out to serve me, to be my people, right? That was the whole, you know, people sometimes say, they quote the first half of, of Moshe's repeated statement to, to Pharaoh in Egypt, let my people go, right? But the second half is, let my people go that they may worship me and, and that they may be my people. I will be your God and you will be my people. God wants this relationship. So God has earned it. God has earned it. He's done everything for Israel. God could say at this point, okay, this is how it's going to go, boys and girls. I'm um, God. These are the rules. Um, Moshe is going to give over the rules and uh, you're going to abide by them and things will be, be good for you. And if not, things won't be so good. But God doesn't present it that way. God goes all out. He goes all out and puts on this, this sound and light show, of a, a phenomenal show of, of, of smoke on the mountain. The mountain is quaking and the people are trembling and there's lightning and there's thunder and there's blast of the shofarot, of the, of, the, of the horns, and this tremendous, tremendous cacophony. And, and it's just beyond, beyond belief, but it's happening, and the people are witnessing it, and they're terrified. So why is Hashem doing all this? He doesn't, why does he, have, he doesn't need to impress Israel. He's already done everything for Israel. And, and why does God go to such great lengths to put on a show? Does God simply just want to, you know, point out that uh, I am so amazing? That, that, you know, I'm so amazing, you better, uh, you better stick with me and, 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 and follow my word or else? I think it's something different. I think God is saying in, in this show, this over-the-top show that he presents before he even begins the Ten Commandments is how much he cares for, how much he respects, how much he honors his people, 
how he wants to put this show on because they're worth it. Because humanity's worth it. Because it's not a simple thing. Because the fact that God can and does take care of us and cares for us and delivers us and, and pulls us out of, out of danger time and time again and feeds us and, and gives us water. It's not a simple thing. It's not a simple power thing. It's not, I'm God, ear man. This is the way it is. No, it's a relationship. And God wants to honor those people. He wants them to know how much this matters to him. He does these things, not because he's God, and he can. He does these things because he loves humanity. He loves Israel. He wants Israel. He wants humanity to succeed. He wants us to thrive. And he wants us to have a relationship with him through thick and thin. So he puts on this tremendous, tremendous show of light and sound. And of course, then... Uh, after many instructions, and he's concerned, you know, it's interesting, he's concerned that Israel, he says to Moshe at the very beginning, tell the people they shouldn't come near the mountain, because it's going to be dangerous. I am just so powerful. My presence is so powerful. And he brought his presence to the people. That's why the mountain was shaking. That's why the lightning and thunder, it was, it was not, God wasn't playing with the forces of nature. God's presence was, was causing the forces of nature to, to respond to his presence in, in, in extraordinary ways. Because God's presence was there, the mountain shook. Because God's presence was there, uh, a thunder, thunder roared and lightning flashed. And, and, and there was smoke and there was fire because God's presence was there. It set off this natural reaction. And God's concerned with Israel. And in fact, at some point, uh, God, God tells Moshe to tell the people, you know, make a, make a fence around the, around the mountain. Don't come any closer because it's dangerous. Someone might get hurt. And God even says it a second time. It's, it's interesting. And, and, and Moshe says, when God says it a second time, he says, but uh, you already told us that, God. They're not going to come near the mountain because you already told us to to stay away, to make a fence, and to keep our distance. So I find it extraordinary that God is, I mean, God's like, he didn't know that. He, 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 he forgot that he had told that to Moshe. Why is he repeating himself? I think one way of understanding it is simply that God so much was concerned. that He, as it were, didn't, wanted to make certain, wanted to make certain that the message was heard and that the people would keep their distance. Um, again, it's God, you know, we're, we're looking here at God in all his glory, and at the same time, we're looking here at God who is so concerned for the well-being of, of these people and of every individual, and so concerned that his message is heard loud and clear, so concerned that he speaks directly to the people. Not because he wants to make a big impression, not because he wants to show them, you know, how amazing it is, but because he wants to make sure that his message gets across, that it's clear, that it's seared into the hearts of everyone. And in fact, we know, we have a tradition that every, every Jew today was a soul at Sinai, and that everyone who, who connects to the Torah and, 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 and honors the God of Israel was a soul at Sinai. And that we all, we understand that we all were there. We all heard God's voice. We all heard that message. We all had that message seared into our hearts, into our beings, into our souls. And that's why it still is so true and so close and so present and so powerful today for each and every one of us. And if it's not, it just means that we simply need to, you know, brush off our, brush off our souls and, and, and do a little introspection and we'll reignite that excitement, that closeness, that awe, and that message that we received at Sinai. So, of course, the Ten Commandments, and the first commandment is basically 
Anochi Hashem, I am God. Yes, I am God. That's the first commandment. Recognize me. Recognize my reality. That is sort of a prerequisite for everything that's going to follow. And then, of course, there's how we worship Hashem, how we don't worship Hashem. And we talk about the Shabbat uh, in the Ten Commandments, and then honor your mother and father. Um, and then, of course, the following commandments are all between man and man. You know, don't steal, don't murder, don't covet what the other has, etc., etc. And again, God is telling Israel that top priority, right up there, seven of the of the top ten commandments, if I'm counting correctly, have to do with how you treat one another. Okay, the first three have to do with how you treat me and how you relate to me and how you understand me so that you don't misunderstand me and make mistakes and have misconceptions. That an understanding Hashem correctly enables us to understand one another and treat one another properly. Because treating one another properly is every much a way of, of, of worshiping and honoring Hashem as is, is not saying his name in vain and keeping the Shabbat, etc., etc. Um, and again, following this week's parsha, next week we'll be reading Mishpatim, which is all about laws between man and man, civil laws, how to treat one another, how to treat one another's property, how to, how to respect one another, how to do, deal with... with Injuries and, 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 and incidents that, un, untoward incidents that we need to deal with and fix. How we deal with one another is a major, if not the, if not the major part of, of what Hashem wants from us and how we honor Hashem. We honor Hashem and, and worship Hashem in many ways. One of those major ways is how we treat one another. How we treat one another with respect because we're all God's children. God created Adam, and we're all the children of Adam. And if that weren't the case, what would be the glue that would bind us together? How would any of this work? We would just be strangers to one another. But we're not strangers. We're brothers and sisters. We're children. We're parents. And we all share that. And as societies, we need to translate that Basic, those basic relationships into how we deal with one another. So that's what much of the Torah will preoccupy itself with. And that is much of the message that Hashem wants to convey in all His glory here at Mount Sinai. And as, as um, the... The, the aftermath of the receiving of the Ten Commandments um, in this direct revelation from Hashem at Mount Sinai, we read uh, in uh, chapter 20, verse 15 of Exodus, the entire people saw the thunder and the flames, the sound of the shofar and the smoking mountain. The people saw it and trembled and stood from afar. They said to Moshe, you speak to us and we shall hear. Let God not speak to us lest we die. And Moshe said to the people, do not fear, for in order to elevate you has God come, so that all of him shall be upon your face, so you shall not sin. What's going on here? The people stood from afar, from afar and Moshe approached the thick cloud where God was. Again, we have this this natural phenomenon: the sound and 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 the and the lightning and and the people. Since the people saw the thunder, they saw the sound. We have this incredible mixing of senses, the, the, the sensory perception. The, the the experience was so powerful, and the people say, "Okay, we're a little bit afraid." <laughs> Naturally, you Moshe speak to speak to Hashem on our behalf, and then in the very conclusion, we what get. What we hear now is the 11th commandment. The 11th commandment, it's such a beautiful commandment. Um, Hashem said to Moshe, So shall you say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make images of what 
of what is with me, gods of silver and gods of gold shall you not make for yourselves. And then God says, an altar of earth shall you make for me, and you shall slaughter near it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your flock and your herd. Wherever I permit my name to be mentioned, I shall come to I shall come to you and bless you. And when you make for me an altar of stones, do not build them hewn, for you will have raised your sword over it and desecrated it. You shall not ascend my altar on steps so that your nakedness will not be uncovered upon it. God is saying to the people, after all these 10 commandments and all this sound and fury and fire and lightning and everything else, an altar, make for me an altar and prepare offerings. That is my beloved way of, of hearing from you from time immemorial, right? We know that from, from Adam, man was, that's how man approached Hashem. This is man's initiative. Man came up with this way of, of reaching out toward Hashem. And Hashem is saying here, I love this. I love how you reach out to me. I'm endorsing it. It's going to be part of our relationship now, etched in stone and etched in your hearts, part of the Torah forever these offerings, this altar, and wherever you build this altar, my name will be there and I will bless you. I just think it's a very, very beautiful response and a very comforting response to the people who are so shaken by what they have seen. And God is saying, okay, it's all good. It's all good. These, these, these commandments that I've given to you from the heavens, they are doable. They are reachable. They're not, as we read in Deuteronomy, they're not in heaven that we can't reach them. They're right here, they're right here, and I'll show you that it's just like the altar. They're do it, they're, they're doable. They, they, they are all gestures that come from you. We can do it. We can have this relationship. And I thank you very much for being with me. Temple Talk.